Well, welcome, 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 my friends, to the Wood Stove edition of More Bad News, brought to you, as always, by Camel Cigarettes. Take the Camel's Challenge, smoke camels for 30 days, and see for yourself what camels can do for you. Well, my friends, this past week, Karen and I got ourselves a new wood-burning stove installed in our living room. All my life, I've kept my home warm with natural gas operating in a central heating system. You set the thermostat and to whatever temperature you desired, and you didn't need to think about it again. It was clean, cheap, efficient, and easy to run. We now have moved to a heating our home with a wood stove, which first required Karen and I to move two cords of wood. We were told to call Jerry, uh, who drove up with a tractor trailer full of, uh, of wood. So Jerry's 82 years old and he cuts and seasons the wood himself and then he sells it locally. And he arrives with this wood uh, and when he came, he helped us unload it. And it took Karen and I several hours to stack it all in the backyard. And now we're hauling the wood from the large stack to a smaller stack by the door and from the smaller stack by the door into the living room and from that stack into the uh, into the, the, the stove. Uh, whereas the old system ran automatically, this one needs to be watched and regulated. It's an art, not a science, uh, is what we've been told and we're, we're beginning to get the, the hang of that. Uh, you can't just set the thermostat. Uh, you have to regulate the fire by controlling the airflow. It's a messy business with dust and wood chips uh, that need to be regularly cleaned. You have to ensure that the stove doesn't get too hot or too cold. Uh, you know, you, you keep the fire at between 500 and 600 degrees. If the fire gets too hot, you end up, uh, if the fire gets too cold, you end up with creosote, uh, and which is a fire hazard. So it's hugely expensive, time consuming and dirty. And all I can say is we love it. It brings us endless joy. It reminds me a lot of a new baby. Uh, there is nothing easy about it. Your life has become much more complicated, but you enjoy all the work in keeping your baby happy. We used to keep the house at around 65 degrees Fahrenheit with the wood stove downstairs hovers now around 75. Uh, and it's radiant heat. It's amazingly wonderful. The house smells of wood. The yard smells of wood. Warmth, the warmth is incredible. We have transformed our living room, discarding the huge TV that once was the center of the room and replacing it with a fire. Instead of watching television, we watch a fire. The stove is like the heart of our home and it glows with warmth. I've never been this warm or happy. And of course, this is the way most human beings heated their homes over the millennium. In some ways, it feels like we're joining the human race again. I remember this feeling years ago at the Sundance after fasting for three days and realizing for the first time that the majority of human beings on this planet live with hunger. To be well fed on a regular basis is a great privilege, not something to be taken for granted. The idea that we need to be thankful for the food that's on our table is rooted in long experience with empty tables and empty stomachs. So I told you that since retiring, I've uh, learned that I don't need hair. Uh, I uh, didn't need to pay to have someone make my head presentable. Well, now I'm learning the monumental uh, um, lesson from retirement. I don't need pants either. Jammies and sweatpants are all you need. At 75 degrees, you don't need a lot of clothes. And now that I've realized that I don't need hair and I don't need pants, it occurs to me also that I don't need to monetize these videos. I just don't need the money. So from now on, the videos will be without advertisements. Uh, I'm doing this for free and you know very well what you get when you don't pay for it. So I really don't need to worry any longer about selling anything that I don't believe in. The only product we're selling here are camels uh, and, uh, and you get what you pay for. That's the caveat. Well, my friends, it's been another week of very bad news. It seems that the mass murders are now coming at us in every direction. The New York Times reported that right-wing extremists are now protesting openly with guns doing the talking. That's the quote. Uh, Mike McIntyre reported, Across the country, openly carrying a gun in public is no longer an exercise in self-defense. Increasingly, it is a soapbox for elevating one's voice and just as often for intimidating and silencing one's enemies. 
This month's armed protesters appeared outside an election center in Phoenix, hurling baseless accusations that the election had been stolen. In October, the Proud Boys with guns joined a rally in Nashville to protest medical treatment for transgender youth. In June, armed demonstrators around the United States uh, 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 armed demonstrations around the United States amounted to nearly one every single day. A group led by the Rep a Republican legislator protested a gay pride event in, in Coeur d'Arlene, Idaho. Men with guns interrupted a Juneteenth festival in Franklin, Tennessee, handing out flyers claiming that white people were being replaced. Imagine Charlottesville, but instead of tiki torches, the demonstrators are all carrying semi-automatic weapons and chanting the Jews will not replace us. Imagine one of these demonstrations turning deadly. It actually happened uh, already. In November 1979, members of the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party killed five people at a Death to the Klan rally in, North, in Greensboro, North Carolina. There were two trials, a state trial for murder and a federal trial for denying the people their civil rights. Uh, they were acquitted in both trials, juries accepting their claim that they were only defending themselves. This kind of violence is not really new. In the 1760s, the Sons of Liberty were terrorizing loyalists as brazenly as any modern Klansman. Uh, in August 1765, a mob formed outside the home of Thomas Hutchinson, Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor, charged with enforcing the Stamp Act. To demonstrate their displeasure, the mob gathered outside Hutchinson's grand home, one of the finest in Boston, just as the family was sitting down for high tea. They escaped with their lives. The mob destroyed his home and everything in it. Another mob attacked one of the king's tax collectors. And on the coldest day of the winter, one of the coldest days of the winter, they, st they stripped him naked, covered him with tar and feathers, dragged him through the streets, and finally uh, lit the uh, feathers on fire. Doctors reported that he died an agonizing death three days later. Politically motivated violence has a long history in America. In 1730, the Virginia House of Burgesses passed the Tobacco Act, which regulated the quality of tobacco that could be exported. Colonial leaders didn't want farmers selling inferior products. It was essential that Virginia tobacco be the finest in the world. In fact, tobacco grown in the colonies was not the native stuff that the Powhatan in Virginia or the Wampanoag in, uh, in England smoked. John Rolfe experimented with seeds that he brought from the West Indies to develop the first commercially viable uh, export crop. Having a brand that one could take pride in didn't begin with camels. In the 1730s, tobacco was the basis for the monetary system. Uh, I've explained that uh, this before, but it bears repeating. The English colonies were business ventures. In England, the peasant farmers did not own land, and most of his obligations were feudal. He dealt with money very little. In America, the small farmer was a small businessman, always looking for a way to bring his product to market. It was one of the fundamental differences between the colonies and the old world. So a guy like George Washington wasn't just a tobacco farmer. He was what was called a general merchant. He had a brick factory on his property. He had a little general store. He was a major real estate dealer and a land surveyor. And so if a neighbor wanted to buy his bricks and had no gold or silver currency, they could give him a promissory note to deliver a hogshead of tobacco after the crop was harvested. This piece of paper could then circulate like cash, and whoever held it uh, when the crop was harvested could claim the tobacco. It was a form of currency, and you had to have a standard of quality, otherwise the paper would be worthless uh, and the exports would suffer. Farmers like George Washington were always in debt to London merchants who extended credit for everything that they needed, but this meant that the American farmers were always indebted to London and it was not unusual for a plantation owner to end up in debtor's prison. Remember, these were the days when you went to jail if you couldn't pay your debts. The American merchant farmer was always desperate for cash and desperate to find a way to maintain commerce without adequate capital. 
You can't run a modern economy without cash. And most colonial legislatures authorized printing paper currency. There were lots of different currencies circulating and you can imagine the difficulty in dealing with an exchange rates. Uh, you show up in New York you know, with money printed in North Carolina and most of the merchants in New York won't take it. You have to find a place where you can exchange it from North Carolina dollars to New York dollars and God knows what the exchange rate is gonna be. It made life very difficult. So you can understand why the colonists were extremely upset when Parliament passed the Currency Act in 1764, which prohibited the issuance of paper currency by the colonial governments. British merchants and tax collectors didn't want to be paid in unstable paper. They wanted to be paid in British pounds, not, uh, not a bill representing a hogshead of tobacco. Well, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, I'll see you next week uh, and uh, have a good week. Um...